So as you know, I'm Jesse Johnson. I'm a conservator and uh, work for the Smithsonian and have since um, 2014. As Brian said, um, I uh, came to Air Beale in uh, 2009, um, uh, and uh, we have been partners basically working and living together when we're in Iraq for the last 10 years. So. Um, so we, we both um, speak about this all the time and we um, both know what, what we're gonna say in any kind of situation. So um, what I wanna do is focus down um, on some of the educational programs and how we've tried to, um, how, we, how we've adapted them based both on what we learned about what worked in the particular situation of Iraq in training and teaching and also um, how we adapted based on all of the things Brian talked about, shifting the funding, um, the difficult difficulties coming in with DASH and things like that over time. But I wanna start with this quote from um, Sultan um, Barakat, who is now the director of the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies at the Doha Institute. Um, the article's titled, Post-War Reconstruction and the Recovery of Cultural Heritage Critical Lessons from the Last 15 Years. He wrote that in 2005. So I thought it'd be appropriate for today's symposium coming 15 years later. When I, I read his article re recently, I found myself in complete agreement with his critical lessons, and I wish my younger self had read the work 10 years ago, because if I had, I might have entered this area of cultural rescue and capacity building much more aware of the broader context of what I've gotten myself into in 2009 when I quit my job at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian and went to Airbeel to teach conservation and collections care for 18 months. That was what I was planning to do. So I wanna show, this is not all of Barakat's critical lessons, but I wanna focus in on five of them that um, are directly, um, uh, directly frame what I'm gonna talk about with the education programs today. The need for a shared vision of recovery, the need for sustained political and financial support, the capacity development of local people and institutions, the active participation of indigenous actors in the design and impl implementation of recovery, and the prioritization of quality of, um, of quality over speed of recovery. So um, keep those ideas in mind as I talk about some of the ways we've um, been doing the training and adjustments that we've made to our training, our education over time. So Brian gave you the background of the Institute um, and what I'm gonna do is describe some of the educational programs in a little more detail and, and as I've said, the evolution over time. So the mission uh, put together by the Advisory Council and Directory Board in about 2010 for the Institute is to preserve the legacy of humanity contained in, to, in the unique cultural heritage of Iraq. And it accomplishes this through educating people in conservation and preservation and by inviting professionals from the around the world to share expertise. So from the beginning, our Rocky partners and, and all of us um, uh, from, from, the, from the West, mostly from America, though not, not everyone is from the US, um, have had this idea that we wanna bring people together from around Iraq, from around the world, and get together and build, um, build something that uh, gives Iraq the ability to better care for its own cultural heritage. I, I put pictures of Brian Leone and also Catherine Hansen up here because they've been deeply involved in everything that I've talked about um, from the beginning. And as Brian said, we've, ha we've had a lot of input from other academic partners and in all the work it's been done in partnership with the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage and, um, and uh, the Iraqi Institute. So um, while we get back to the, to the slides, um, from the beginning, what we, the idea from the beginning um, and why the Institute program was started um, was, was based on some experiences the early advisors had of trying to bring people to the US and either um, finding that they couldn't really learn um, what they needed to in the time they were able to be here 
or um, just people not being able to get visas. So from the beginning, um, we were trying to develop a program that met international standards, avoided the pitfalls of disjointed short courses, and promoted communications and critical thinking skills. So for every course that we do um, at the Institute, we bring in what we call visiting faculty or visiting lecturers who have a strong expertise in a particular topic. And we do this by dividing every course, no matter what the topic, into blocks with different subjects. So um, for example, one topic um, in the collections care and conservation course might be ivory conservation. Um, in the architectural, um, architectural conservation course, it might be specifically on um, uh, the structure of architecture, or architectural stabilization. So if we have a 24-week program, for example, we might have eight or 10 different um, lecturers who come in from abroad to do the teaching. At the beginning, um, since the beginning, we've asked these teachers to do a report um, of their work at, in the same format from the beginning. So we're always, always getting the same input from the teachers as they come back and tell us about what worked, what didn't, what we need to do to improve the library, um, what equipment can we get, what supplies do we need, what were struggles that they saw all the students had. So we um, built up a knowledge of, of uh, what was needed to improve the course by uh, getting the input of all of these different experts that we're bringing in. And of course, we always ask for the students to um, review the teachers so that we know who are very effective teachers and who we want to invite back again and again. We've also, from the very beginning, have um, people working with us called Master Trainers, um, a very strange uh, cobbled together name, um, but they're basically assistant teachers that have been working with us for a long time now. And they were the top students selected out of the first two or three years of teaching, uh, selected to help as um, teaching and lab assistants. And most of the Master Trainers actually have other jobs working in, in the antiquities ministry or museums around the country when they're not working with us. And at this point, these individuals have supported and attended years of teaching at the Institute. So they're now teaching parts of our courses, much of the lab portions of our courses, and also doing teaching back in their home office when they go home. We've also been able to give the master trainers more practical experience through field work at the site of Gordian, which is a pen museum project in Turkey, and where I've worked for many years. And all of the master trainers are now participating as team members in other international research projects taking place where they live. So in Airbnb, we also have the opportunity of using local cultural heritage resources is the training ground. We, can't, we can walk up to the Airbnb Citadel there at the top and use the historic houses for documentation practice. We can go to the Airbnb Civilizations Museum to learn about environmental, environmental monitoring or identifying materials. And we visit conservation projects that are underway around the, around the city to talk about some of the decision making that goes into how much restoration do you do? How do you stabilize things but not completely rebuild? things like that. And then um, the, the educational programs are always a mix of a lot of practical and a lot of lecture. We show and explain international standards, but we know most of our students work in places where they don't have funding or access to much equipment or materials or even electricity. And so we teach skills to allow them to make informed choices about the materials they do have access to. So for example, what's the most stable glue that you can find if you can't get what conservators always say should be used, something called Paraloid B72. So here, these are all glues that we found in the local market, and they're testing them to see what makes them good or bad for a particular use. How do you use your cell phone for doing GPS? How do you evaluate the packing and storage materials that you can get to make sure they're not going to get cause damage if you can't get the materials that you might hear about um, from international experts or um, searching online in the Western conservation literature? And by doing this, then this gives um, critical thinking skills that the students can use and help to change how they do the work when they go, they go home. So as Brian said, uh, during 2009 and 2014, we established three different areas of education, um, collections care and conservation, archaeological site conservation, and ar architectural, um, architectural conservation. 
Based on reviews and discussions that we had about these programs that took place in 2000, and we had a formal review done. We had a lot of discussions in advisory council meetings. We identified the need to um, develop a, what we call a fundamentals course that, gave, that gives all the students a basic grounding in skills anyone working with cultural heritage needs. And this goes back to some of the things Brian was saying about their, their there have been real gaps in knowledge that people have because of the, uh, the way that Iraqis have been cut off from the rest of the world for so long. So this includes topics like basic computer skills, photography skills, lab safety, measurement and scale, presentation skills, and general topics. So our visiting lecturers were feeling they were spending too much of their time on these basic skills and not being able to get to the meat of conservation. But then Dash arrived, and they pushed into the outskirts of Erbil, and in August 2014, we had to cancel an archaeological site conservation program taking place at the Institute and send students home. Dash was stopped and didn't overtake Erbil, so our local colleagues remained safe, though, as we know, many, many others suffered abominably. Luckily, um, the Smithsonian and the University of Pennsylvania were willing to go back into Airbnb and began training programs just a few months later. And this was with the expectation, of course, that ISIS was going to be pushed out. And, and so they, there was an eight-week eight disaster recovery course that took place based on the first aid for conservation course that you all heard about earlier today. And since 2015 and, and 16, the Smithsonian's been the lead of, of all the educational programs at, at the Institute. So in 2016, we, um, we uh, developed the Fundamentals of Heritage Conservation course, which we're now in the third, um, uh, we're teaching now for the third time. And um, as I said, it's to give these uh, basic background skills. The course is, runs 20 to 24 weeks, depending how much funding um, we get, and we very much thank the variety of funders that have supported this course. Um, we've also done uh, more targeted training based on specific requirements. So oh, these are just a few more pictures of the fundamentals course. Here we're doing a course on um, teaching skills for the master trainers so that they learn more about curriculum development, they can practice lecturing. We did a ceramics conservation course based on um, uh, working with our friends at the RBL Civilizations Museum. And um, we also recently held a workshop for communities affected by ISIS. So we're now beginning to work more with people, not just working for governmental agencies caring for cultural heritage, but these are our master trainers teaching uh, short workshops for people who are um, working to develop um, uh, new museums or collect things coming out of uh, religious communities and ethnic communities in the north that were really traumatized by, by Daesh. This leads me to the Nimrud Rescue Project, which, as we've said, um, uh, Kent is going to talk about. But I want to make one point, which is that the education programs of this site-based project are, um, have been car carried out in the same reflexive, collaborative way as we've built our other training programs. We carried out a series of training modules for the Iraqis who work at the Nineveh Antiquities Department to give them the skills to carry out recovery and stabilization at the site of Nimrud. And at the end of each of these modules, we worked with the team leader to define what else he needed, what, what they needed to carry out the project, and then we came back and we did that training. And importantly to know, the team leader, who's also the director of the Mosul Museum, was one of our first graduates back in 2010. So we're seeing now the effects of the work and our, our dedication to going back to Iraq for so long. And then I'll just end with one slide um, about the Mosul Cultural Museum and say with our work there, um, uh, the, con the head of conservation at the Mosul Museum is also one of our early graduates. And this is a project we're doing um, with the Aleph Foundation and the Louvre Museum. And we've been supporting documentation wrought by the wrought by documentation of the destruction wrought by ISIS, but then also helping them begin uh, the recovery process of collecting, sorting, and storing, and the beginnings of doing treatments of the objects that ISIS left behind. We're currently planning a program that will support rebuilding and the management and operations of the museum into the future. This is an ongoing project we're at the beginning of, and you'll hear a lot more about it in the future. 
So with that, again, many, many people have been um, supporting us, many funders, many advisors for a long time, and I, I thank all of them and all of you very much. Thank you.